Tenokoto, Tenokoto, Koto Katua. I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening to this year's annual school, uh, annual Ron Liston Memorial Lecture, which we're about to present. It's a special treat and an honor to welcome the friends of Ron Lister this evening. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Richard Blakey, who's with us this evening. In terms of a few health and safety details, in the event of an emergency, please could you exit from the front doors or a door at the back. Um, if you need to go to the toilets, they're off the side corridors on my left-hand side. And then after this meeting, uh, there will be a small reception held upstairs to which you're all invited. It's in the humanities common room and the stairs to get there on the corridor just behind the wall behind me. So in terms of this evening, um, we hold this lecture annually to commemorate the life and work of Professor <clears throat> Ron Lister. Ron Lister was the founding professor of geography at Otago, and his legacy of scholarship and research placed the school on the firm footing and the academic trajectory which we enjoy today. Ron Lister was a charismatic individual, he was an accomplished communicator, and he had a driving passion for geography, and above all, the role geography can play in serving the community. He strove tirelessly to advance the cause of the subject in the country, advancing research and scholarship, and particularly its application in the applied sense. Now, in terms of this annual lecture, it's our custom to invite a distinguished academic to present it every year. And this year, it's my honor that we can invite Professor Tony Binns, who, as many of you know, holds the position of the Ron Lister Chair of Geography to address us this evening. Before I invite Tony to join us, there's a few words I'd like to say as an introduction and welcome to Tony. Tony hails from the UK. Uh, his initial uh, research studies were undertaken at Sheffield, and following a brief stint as a teacher at uh, Doncaster, he then started his long association with Africa. He undertook his PhD and master's studies at the Centre for West African Studies in Birmingham, and the, at that uh, position, his love for Africa was catalyzed. He undertook his PhD work in Sierra Leone in the 1970s and thereafter followed a love affair for Africa which has led to him working over a period of what's now approaching 50 years in more than 20 different African countries. He's published extensively on that work uh, with a net result that to his name he now has 21 books and 147 articles or book chapters. He has a PBRF rating, and his work has been widely recognized in academic communities around the world. His work focuses on the challenges which communities experience, particularly those living in fragile environments and countries facing political instability. But in addition to the focus on the problems particularly of Africa, much of his work also focuses on the community-based responses to those challenges, the way in which community can be a key asset in catalyzing a new uh, way forward and drawing on community resilience. But it's not only in terms of research that uh, Tony's accomplishments are well recognized. In terms of teaching, as many of our students know, he's an outstanding teacher. He's received three teaching awards across his career, and hundreds of students choose to take geography courses because of Tony's ability to make the subject come alive and to inspire them about how to deal with real-world challenges. Uh, this is a similar motivation as to why he's successfully supervised over 30 PhD students and 190 master's students to date. In terms of service, Tony's role is equally exemplary, and just a few cameos uh, e exemplify the role he plays. In the UK, he helped ensure at a cabinet level the future of geography as a school subject. In New Zealand, he established UNIVOL, which runs under the Voluntary Service Abroad Program, and it's enabled dozens of young New Zealanders to, to contribute their skills and talent to, to development projects around the world. Other noteworthy achievements include his holding of the presidency of the UK Geographical Association, the presidency of the New Zealand Geographical Society, and the Commonwealth uh, Geographical Bureau. Now that accomplishment and, and very strong CV takes us on to the focus of tonight's lecture.
Tony commenced his work in Sierra Leone well over 40 years ago. And over that time, he's witnessed very significant changes in the life and livelihoods of West Africa. He's witnessed how countries have transitioned and how Sierra Leone in particular transitioned from a post-independence scenario through the initial days of optimism, then unfortunately through periods of civil war and disease. Despite this, Tony has remained resolute in his commitment to Sierra Leone and Africa more broadly not only in terms of documenting its development challenges and trying to offer solutions, but also in terms of direct and tangible support for the communities he works in. In this regard, he has supported community members directly um, through his own financial contributions within communities in West Africa, and he's raised funds in the village of, uh, to, in the village of Kaima to support the local school and the clinic. And Kaima is the focus of tonight's lecture. In recognition of the role Tony has played over the years, the, the community in Kaima bestowed on him the title of Chief Manjawa of Sandor in 2014. And Tony is wearing the garb of a chief of the Sandor Kingdom to, uh, today. So thank you for that, Tony. What is particularly significant about Tony's recent work is the degree to which he's now reflecting on how life and livelihoods in Kaima have changed over the decades. And that's what he'll be referring to tonight. There are very few well-established longitudinal studies of community development in Africa. And Tony is contributing tonight to that very small pool of knowledge. He's going to share his insight with us, and we're going to learn about both the opportunities and the challenges which have faced post-independence Africa. So with those words, I'd like to invite Tony to come up and address us on his title, which is A Place Called Kaima, Poverty and Resilience in a Remote Sierra Leone Community. Over to you, Tony. Thank you. Kia ora. Tane koutou, tane koutou. Um, Etienne, thank you very much indeed for your kind words. Um, I feel quite honoured to be invited to give the Ron Lister lecture. Um, I was appointed to the chair, the Ron Lister chair, in 2004. Uh, but unfortunately, I never met Ron Lister. But I've met loads of people that knew Ron Lister very well, and the comments I've heard are overwhelmingly po positive. He was obviously quite an inspirational figure. And um, I wish I could have met him. Uh, but we have this lecture every year um, as a tribute to Ron. And indeed, uh, the success of the department, or the school as we are now, or a school of geography, that, in, that also is a tribute to Ron's foundation work uh, for many years between the... Um, the 1950s, and I think it was 1981 that he retired. But I know there are a number of good friends in this audience uh, today who knew Ron and were taught by Ron. So um, uh, thank you for coming, all of you. I'm just going to close the door. Uh, oh, oh, all right, Philip, thank you. Um, good. Um, you probably, well, Etienne sort of explained what this is that I'm wearing. This is the gown that I was given in um, 2014 in Kaima, in the remote part of Sierra Leone. Um, it's a traditional um, Kono people's gown for a chief. Um, according to the Otago Daily Times, I'm the only chief in Dunedin. Uh, and, of course, we all believe everything the Otago Daily Times tells us, so they must be right. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, one place tonight, but a place that we've managed to follow over 46 years, not quite 50, but four, 46 years, um, a place called Kaima. Now, of course, place is uppermost in many geographers' minds. The focus on place, an understanding of place, what has often been referred to as a sense of place, is very much uppermost in a lot of work we as geographers do. And uh, I've just put a few short quotations here from some of the luminaries in geography. Peter Haggett saying, 
Place also means a particular position on the Earth's surface. But in contrast to location, it's not used in an abstract sense, but confined to an identifiable location on which we load certain values. We have ideas, we have perceptions, and so on. And Ron Johnson, who sadly died fairly recently, um, places are social creations. They have separate identities because people have made them so. Um, and then Dory Massey, another wonderful geographer, if places can be conceptualized in terms of the social interactions which they tie together, then it's also the case that these interactions themselves are not motionless things frozen in time. They are processes. So we as geographers are interested in how places change, how they develop and so on, the, the, the morphology, if you like, of places over time as well as, as, well as space. And that's what I'm trying to do in my talk tonight. And Ron Lister, in fact, um, as I say, I, I never actually met him, but from, his, from the work I know of his, um, he was also fascinated and highly committed to places. He played a key role in the Manapuri campaign, for example. He played a key role in, in setting up the Peninsula Trust for the Otago Peninsula. Um, I even heard that he was involved in planning the one-way system through Dunedin, um, which, um, you know, the ODT seems to think might get scrapped, which I'm rather worried about, because I can get through there fairly quickly on the lights as they are at the moment. But anyway, Ron Lister was, um, Ron Lister was also fascinated in, in, in um, places. So here we are in Kaima. I'm not, I'm not taking you to Las Vegas or thank God, um, but I'm taking you to somewhere which is miles away from anywhere, and this is the uh, rather unceremonial entrance to Kaima in, uh, in uh, Sierra Leone. And this is Kaima from the air, uh, from a Google satellite. You see, it's not, not very big. Um, you've got the, the main, oh, this is a strange pointer. You've got the main town there, and this is the old town. This actually predates the main town here. But you see, it's not very big. You see how it's surrounded by, by forests, mainly secondary forest, i.e. it's been cultivated and has then regrown. Um, and you can see sort of patches of farmland where the people farm, because 90% of the people in Kaima are farmers. Um, And this is a fairly recent picture of Kaima. Um, the only way that it differs from 1974 when I first went there um, is the cell phone mast here, uh, which was put up, I believe, in 2011 by the new Paramount chief. But apart from that, it all looks very, very familiar. This building over here is the chief's compound. Um, it looks very grand from here, but a lot of it isn't used. They tend to use the lower stories of the building, really. But um, this, is, um, this is Main Street, Kaima, here, <laughs> such as it is. But it's a place that when I get to this point, as I'm going to Kaima, and I see it in front of me, I, I get sort of chills, you know. It's really quite, you know, I feel I'm sort of coming home. Um, anyway, just, uh, we have to have a map don't we? Um, so just to show you uh, where we are, there is Sierra Leone in the west of Africa. As Etienne said, I've, I've done work in about 20 African countries over the year, but I guess the thing about Sierra Leone is my continuity, the fact I've been able to continue to uh, visit Sierra Leone. Here's a map of the country, and uh, roughly circular. Um, Freetown is the capital that you may have heard of, but we're going right up here to the northeast, Kaima. So, um, one of the poorest countries in the world and one of the poorest parts of one of the poorest countries. It really is very remote. Let me just introduce Kaima to you. It's about 344 kilometers from the capital city, Freetown. The nearest town uh, is called um, Koidu, and that's about, 100, uh, that's about um, 40 kilometers away. The last 35 kilometers to Kaima, well, 
I suppose in New Zealand you call it a gravel road, but I can assure you there was no gravel on it at all. It was rock. <laughs> you need a four-wheel drive vehicle to get that last 34 kilometres. Etienne came with me once and uh, he knows it well. Um, so um, uh, the significance of Kaima is it's the headquarters, the chiefdom headquarters of Sandor chiefdom, which is the largest chiefdom in the Kono district. The whole country is divided up into chiefdoms, and each chiefdom has a paramount chief. What is very interesting is that the population has hardly changed. I'm sorry about this weird pointer, um, which obscures everything else. But what I'm trying to show you is that in 1963, at the census, it had 1,853 people, and in 2013, only 1881. So it's hardly grown over that period of time. You know, you think of Africa having, as having rapid population growth and urban centers being even more rapid than rural areas. Well, Kaima's population has hardly increased, and I might be able to give you some clues to that as we go, as we go through the lecture. Um, in terms of physical geography, it's about 366 metres above sea level, but it has quite a massive rainfall figure, uh, which is more than three times that of Dunedin. Um, if you went to Freetown, I'm pretty sure the rainfall figure there would be four or five times the amount of, uh, of Dunedin. Uh, Freetown has a phenomenal rainfall, rainfall total. Um, the vegetation is mainly bush, secondary forest, um, and some savanna, some grassland. Okay, now um, Etienne touched on this earlier on. I think uh, the significance of what I'm talking about is that across the whole of the African continent, 54 countries, there have been very few longitudinal studies. Very, very few studies have been undertaken over a period of time. Um, the only ones I could think of was um, uh, Margaret Haswell's work in the Gambia, Audrey Richards' work in the Bem among the Bemba in Zambia, Michael Mortimer's work in northern Nigeria, Mary Tiffin in Kenya, and there's a guy called Paul Richards, an anthropologist, who's worked in southern Sierra Leone. But I can't think of any others. Um, so I think a longitudinal study is actually very valuable in showing you change over time. So how did it become a longitudinal study? Well, first of all, I went there to do my PhD in 1974. And I tell my students it was the best year of my life. I was there for a whole year, and it was just wonderful. I'd always wanted to go to Africa, and it was better than expected, I can assure you. And I just loved it, living, living in Kaima mainly. Um, but 1974, what about the other side of the longitudinal spectrum. Well, that was due to um, my good friend, Jerem Bateman here. And Jerem, I'm pleased to say, is with us uh, this evening. He's just become a dad for the first time. I thought he might have come in with the baby strapped to him, but fortunately he hasn't. Uh, but uh, Jerem did his PhD in 2014, which was exactly 40 years after I'd done my PhD. And so, with his work and my work, we're able to compare, and we've got this longitudinal study. Uh, Jerem's PhD was outstanding, and he received a letter from the Vice-Chancellor saying what an outstanding PhD it is. Not all, not all students receive that letter, but Jerem did, and it really is a fantastic piece of work. So, by um, looking at my work and his work, and Jerem actually used a lot of my surveys, uh, or adapted them in some cases, uh, but um, a lot of it was based on the questions that I'd asked. I managed to persuade Emirates to let me bring my questionnaires here. Um, for some, I don't know how the hell I did it, but I got these questionnaires out of Sierra Leone over to the UK, and then they were in a box. They were all pink paper, I remember. And when I leaved through them, there were various dead insects, you know, and um, hopefully no tetsy flies or scorpions or anything like that. But then I persuaded Emirates to let me bring them here, and I presented Jerem with this great box of questionnaires. Of course, in the 70s, they were all handwritten, 
uh, there were no computers in those days. And in fact, my thesis was typed on, a, on a, an old-fashioned typewriter. Type well, my Auntie Betty actually typed it. Um, it took her about three months, and for which she got a rose bush from me, um, which sort of didn't really flourish very well, unfortunately. But, um, so, um, but, so that's what it was like in the 70s. But Jerem, of course, had the advantage of... Um, he even had internet access when he was there. He used to send me emails and so on. Uh, but he was able to use computer and produced an absolutely fantastic PhD. So let me go back to 19... Sorry, the wrong button. Let me go back to 1974. There we are. I've tried to think back to how Kaima was kept contextualized at that time. Well, the Sierra Leone government policy at that time was promoting swamp rice development. They wanted rice is the staple food. That's the key thing. You wouldn't think that. But here in West Africa, rice is the staple food. And the government wanted to develop swamp rice rather like the Chinese model, paddy, paddy field and so on. And they were absolutely paranoid about achieving self-sufficiency in foodstuffs. That was all they seemed to want to do, just achieve self-sufficiency in foodstuffs, and particularly self-sufficiency in rice. Diamond mining was getting very active at that time in the 1970s there. Um, uh, and I'll talk more about diamond mining later. Of course, many of you will have seen the Blood Diamond film, uh, which, is, which my friends in Sierra Leone would tell me is sort of true to life. Um, but during the diamond mining phase, there was a lot more activity in diamond mining, and there was a lot more food marketing because the diamond miners needed to be fed, and they weren't growing crops at the time, so they were being fed by the farmers. Um, diamond exports then represented 60% of the gross domestic product of Sierra Leone. But the Sierra Leone government was very concerned about the negative effect of diamond mining on agricultural production. So though that was the sort of context in which I was working. And my thesis was looking at the relationship between diamond mining and a rural development. And my overall conclusion was that, in fact, in Kaima, many of the farmers were benefiting from selling large quantities of food to the people in the mining areas. I can remember um, great big boxes of cassava. I can remember vast amounts of oranges and pineapples all being sent down the road uh, to uh, the diamond mining area, which is about 25 kilometers away. Um, so there was a lot of activity in those days. But things have changed, as you'll see in a minute. Um, just a little bit on the context of Sierra Leone. I'm, we're going to come to some pictures in a minute. I don't want to bore you with loads of, you know, loads of uh, slides with words on. <laughs> um, Sierra Leone is about the size of Scotland or South Carolina. It was a British colony till 1961. Population now is about 7.5 million. And Freetown has a population of about 1.5 million. It was 240,000 when I was there in 1975, so Freetown has grown massively during this period. Um, and in 2002, the country emerged from a decade-long civil war, uh, where the Blood Diamond film was actually sort of set during that period. It's one of the poorest countries in the world, and I looked up on Transparency International on the Corruption Perception Index, this is the way businesses and other organizations perceive corruption in the country. Sierra Leone is 119 out of 180, and it's actually moved up, so it's getting better. Uh, you might be interested to know that um, our own country, um, New Zealand, is number one at the top at the moment. New Zealand, according to Transparency International, is the least, the least perceived corruption country in the world. But anyway, if we look at these statistics here at the bottom, um, Sierra Leone is ranked right at the bottom of the Human Development Index, 184 out of 189. So it's the world's sixth poorest country. Life expectancy is only 52 years. Adult literacy is about just over 32%. And then it's when you get to these figures at the bottom that it gets really worrying. 
Um, infant mortality, that's the number of children that die before the age of one per thousand live births. In New Zealand, it's currently 4.55. In Sierra Leone, it's 83.3. Under five mortality, deaths under the age of five is even worse. Over 113 per thousand in Sierra Leone, 5.4 thousand in in, in New Zealand. But it's the bottom one that's the, the most frightening of all, maternal mortality. This is the number of women that die uh, before, during, or after childbirth uh, per 100,000 live births. The average for the world is 216, but Sierra Leone is 1,360. So the maternal mortality is a big issue um, in, in Sierra Leone. Um, since independence, I, I've just listed, so I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, independence in 1961, and then um, f sadly the, the first Prime Minister died, Milton Margai. Um, where are we? There. Milton Margai died, his brother then took over, and there were three military coups between 67 and 68. And then a guy called, um, oh sorry, um, pressing the wrong one. Um, a guy called Shaka Stevens then uh, became, became president from 1968 to 85. He called himself president. It became a one-party state. There was massive corruption, and everything really slid downhill. Um, he was getting old, and in 1985, um, he um, handed the leadership over. There wasn't an election. He handed the leadership over to a guy called Brigadier Joseph Momo, who, quote, was notoriously inept, and he inherited a predatory regime that was steeped in corruption, opportunism, cronism, and sycophancy. So uh, things were pretty bad by the la late 1980s. Uh, Momo um, uh, implemented the Structural Adjustment Program, which caused major strife across the country. Um, and um, he then, uh, the, the, there was a lot of unemployment and the education system collapsed and what Paul Richards calls a crisis of youth. Young people who were unemployed and disaffected. And that was the seeds for the Civil War. Lots of young people who saw they got no future uh, were whipped up into this rebel army in the Civil War. Sierra Leone got sucked into this because there was a civil war next to, in the neighboring country in Liberia, and Sierra Leone supported bombing ra raids in, in Liberia, bombing raids by West African troops. And as a result of that, the leader of, the leader of um, uh, Liberia, Charles Taylor, uh, got this rebel army together and sent them across the border into Sierra Leone. And the idea was to get all the diamonds, to exchange them for guns and so on, uh, and to destabilize the government. So the, the, the war really started in March 1991, when there was horrible killing, destroying of buildings, mutilation and things like that. It was a terrible period. And this went on until January 2002, when uh, the, the, the war was pronounced ended. There was a peace treaty and it was ended. What happened to Kaima? Well, Kaima was completely abandoned for about five years during the Civil War. People saw the rebels coming, they were setting fire to buildings and so on, and people just abandoned Kaima. They went into the bush, they went across the border into Guinea or into the northern province, uh, in the neighboring northern province. And so this is a map that we put together um, after the Civil War. And what we've done here, uh, the black, um, I think it might be easier if I use a pointer, the old-fashioned pointer, rather than that thing. Um, what we've done here is um, looked at the demolished buildings, the buildings that suffered uh, during the Civil War. So all the black squares are built. So th the place was pretty much destroyed during the Civil War. Even the buildings that were still there um, uh, uh, probably didn't have roofs on or whatever. 
Let me take you through a few pictures now. This, let me go right back to Kaima in 1974. This was the old Paramount Chief, pa Paramount Chief Fasiluku Sonsiama OBE. He got an OBE from the Queen. And this is one of his many, many wives. I think this was wife number 37. <laughs> um, you know, um, senior Muslim figures uh, can have up to four wives, but uh, paramount chiefs um, have uh, far more than that. Uh, so she's looking very rather scared of me taking the picture. But this was the guy who gave me permission to work in the community to undertake my, my field work. And here we are, um, a rather young, handsome man. <laughs> I think I've changed a bit since then. Um, I think John Betjeman would say, pleasing decay. <laughs> that was one of his favorite phrases. But this is the paramount chief wearing one of these outfits. And this is the chiefdom speaker, the right-hand administrator of the chiefdom. And this was a quiet street in Kaima, taken from where I was staying. Um, very peaceful. In, in the dry season, January, February and so on, gets quite cold at night. You wake up in the morning and there's a mist and, mist and it's sort of crisp, crisp clean air. It's, it's lovely. Um, and here I am doing some of my interviews on the, on the veranda with uh, one of the students from the university, Brahma Josiah. He's now uh, chief executive of a big um, NGO. Oh, and here's me having a go at uh, um, harvesting rice. I was quite good looking in those days, wasn't I? <laughs> and had some hair, uh, but I guess we all go this way. Um, uh, and this was the family I lived with, or part of the family I lived with. I couldn't really fit the whole family on. Uh, th that lady was wife number one, and that lady was wife number four. And here are some of the children. Um, sadly, this one, Monday died of sickle cell anemia when he was 20 years old. Um, but the others are still alive. Bundaka is somebody I've been supporting for quite a long time. And Sa Sonsiyama, he's still there. He's now one of the chiefs in the community. And let's look at more recent pictures, 2014 and today. Here we are. This is the top of the hill where you come into Kaima. And we've got the cell phone mast, but we also have a new church. And um, I think it's fair to say about 50% of the people are Christian and probably about 50% Muslim. And people have asked me the question before, did they get on with each other? And the answer is yes, it's very harmonious. There is no religious tension in Sierra Leone. Religion was not a cause of the civil war at all. So that's a great thing. There's no sort of fundamentalism that we've seen in other countries. Um, so it's a very harmonious relationship. This is the main street, and this is the uh, meeting house here, the Court Barry, which was built when I was there in 74. Um, you can see um, some of the houses, some of them are still empty, actually, after the, after the Civil War. And there are one or two ruins there. And I asked people, why have you not rebuilt these houses? And they said, because a good friend was in there and he died during the war. And they've left the house as a sort of grave, really. Uh, they've obviously buried the, the, the person, but the house has been left as a sort of shrine. Um, this is the school. Uh, this school was not there in 1974. Um, it's actually now a senior secondary school. So they take pupils up to perhaps 17, 18 or so. Um, so there was no secondary school when I was there, just a primary school. This is the bank, which also wasn't there in 1974, the community bank, Sandor Community Bank. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And here's me with the current Paramount Chief. Uh, you notice he's wearing his dad's OBE. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to compare with that, but here he is with his, um, uh, with his father's OBE, which he keeps in a little box. Um, and this is one of my visits back there, greeting the people that I've known for a long, long time. Um, and this was the room that I stayed in for a year, on the veranda of the house. And this is uh, the wife number one again, lovely woman. 
and this is her oldest son, Sa, and uh, he was just a, a little boy when I was there in 1974. And then, uh, going, you see hundreds of children everywhere you go. It's wonderful. Uh, so here I am, uh, you know, I feel totally welcomed and safe when I go back to this community. And this was when we got everybody together to talk to them about a number of development projects that, that we've been involved in, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And this was when I was uh, made uh, a chief in 2014. And the, everybody turned out with the drums and the music and things. This woman here has got this ring here, and these are bones. Can you see? They're jaw bones. And she rattles them uh, on this. This is their sort of improvised musical instrument. OK, now what about livelihoods in Sierra Leone? Most people are farmers, and they grow um, um, upland rice is the main type of farm, up, upland rice. There is an African variety of rice. It's called Aritza glabarima. You probably think of rice as being a very much an Asian crop, but there is an African variety of rice. Um, seasonality plays a key role in this community. Rainy season, dry season, and so on. They intercrop the rice with a range of other crops, like maize, pumpkin, beneseed, yams, beans, and so on. But they also grow what we might call cash crops, that they would sell things like co coffee, cocoa, palm oil, pineapple, banana, citrus fruits, and so on. They don't have any machinery. It's entirely dependent on household labor. So the number of workers you have in your family is absolutely crucial. And the women and children play a key role in, in farming and household activities. And in the, in the dry season is the time when people go and do a bit of diamond mining. Now, I use this diagram with my students because it illustrates the seasonality. Basically, the, rain begin, the rains begin round about March and get heavier and heavier. And this is the main rainy season. And that's when they grow the crops, making use of the rain, the water. And then from October onwards, the crops are ripe, ripening, and that's when they harvest them. So the dry season goes from November through to March. Um, and these are the different jobs that they do on the farm at different points in time. It's quite a busy, a busy farming year. So this is a typical farm, very different from a, an Otago farm, isn't it? Um, so it's on a steep slope, and he's broadcasting the rice seed. Um, they broadcast the seed in true biblical fashion. And there's a lot of, these are not weeds, these are other crops that have been planted. The idea being to cover the surface of the soil to reduce the impact of rainfall and therefore to prevent soil erosion. Similarly, the tree stumps are left in also to bind the soil together, and so the trees grow again after they've abandoned the farm. So it's actually quite a well-organized system, quite sustainable. The women do a lot of the weeding. It's traditionally a woman's job. It can be a, a timely and back-breaking job. Um, they've already done that bit there, and the, the weeds are put on a compost and then put on the vegetable garden. So organic composting is very common. And this is the harvest season. Um, this is uh, um, October, November time, and everybody takes part in the harvest. And this woman, after the harvest, is making a vegetable garden to plant um, uh, various vegetables, onions, I think, here, and carrots, uh, and uh, cassava, and things such as that. And uh, here are some cocoa seedlings. They, they're increasing the amount of cocoa they grow in, cocoa and coffee, because they can sell those, and they can get money for that. Um, this is a market, a small market in, in Kaima, and the market tends to be under the charge of the women. And this is diamond mining. This is what it's like. Now, the thing about diamond mining in Sierra Leone, it's not like it is in South Africa. In South Africa, you've got deep shafts, and you have, you have to go down in a, a lift and so on. Here, the, the diamonds are found in gravels on the sides and the, bed, the banks of the rivers. So they're reasonably accessible. 
except there's far fewer now than there were before the Civil War. And this work is usually done by young men, um, sort of 18 to 25. It's quite heavy work, and they're shoveling the gravels. And here, they put the gravels into sieves and wash it and hold it up and hope that there's a diamond, if they're lucky. Um, some of the finest gemstones have actually come from Sierra Leone, because diamonds, you can divide into industrial diamonds and gemstones, and some of the finest gemstones have come from, uh, from Sierra Leone. Now, one of the things that we've noticed from my work and comparing it with Jerem's work is um, there is still a lot of poverty in this community. Uh, the road is much worse now than it was in the 70s. There are limited transport options. Very few people have cars. What we're seeing now is the use of motorbikes much more, even on the very difficult road. There are fewer trading opportunities because there are not as many people wanting the food down in the mining areas. And people are subsistence farmers in that their main concern is to feed their families. Food surpluses are irregular. And there's quite a lot of food insecurity, and I'll say a little bit about that in a few minutes. There's only a small market in Kaima. You've got to go further to a bigger market. But in the 70s, as I told you earlier, large amounts of food were transported down to the mining areas. There are a few people in Kaima that actually earn wages. Um, they would be people in the clinic, the schools, the bank, and the police. The rest of the people are just growing food to feed their families. And the households are affected by a variety of what we call shocks. And I'll talk about this in just a minute. So what we found, and looking at Jerem's work as well, was that many of the vulnerabilities of 1974 still persist today. Um, we can talk in terms of different types of shocks that affect these households. First of all, there are the sort of macro-level shocks. Dysfunctional national government, one-party state, centralization of political power, structural adjustment policies. The war had a massive effect on the community and many other communities. And then they were just getting over the war and Ebola struck. Jerem was fortunate in just being able to get his work done before there was a lockdown with Ebola. And there were nearly 4,000 deaths from Ebola in Sierra Leone. As far as we know, there weren't any in Kaima, uh, but uh, the place, the country was all locked down. And the lockdown mentality, I think, has enabled them to cope with COVID. They know what to do about locking down and staying at home. So COVID numbers, these are the latest figures I've got, are really quite low. Um, of course, New Zealand is lower than that. Uh, but then they're not increasing very rapidly, but then you have to ask, you know, are the statistics really reliable? But it does seem as if the incidence of COVID is quite low at the moment. And then we have the, what we call the local level shocks, the recurring shocks. Okay, uh, the World Food Pro Program did a study in 2011 and they found that 85% of rural households in Sierra Leone had recently experienced some type of shock affecting household production and consumption. The sort of shocks we're talking about are things like birds and rodents eating crops, household health problems. You know, if the main farmer um, gets malaria, he probably can't work for two weeks and the farm is just left if there's nobody else to do it and the yields go down accordingly. Unexpected expenditure on medical treatment. You know, when I was there, they were paying 10 shillings, British shillings, for an injection. And that's a lot of money for people in Sierra Leone. So medical treatment is expensive, and that can be a shock on the household budget. Out-migration is a big problem. Now, you saw earlier that the population has not grown very much. There has been quite a lot of out-migration. And when young people move out for education or to see the bright lights of the city, um, the labor force is reduced, and that's effect that affects the amount of food they can actually grow. Um, the death of a family member. Um, you could be spending 
two or three weeks mourning somebody with a funeral and the mourning ceremonies afterwards. It's also expensive. You have to give food and so on. You, there, was a, there was a funeral of a 14-year-old boy when I was there. And um, I reflected on it. I was relatively young myself, but I reflected on it and I thought, uh, Tony, you can't go carry on working. So I just stopped all my interviews and I was asked to go and speak at the funeral. Um, and then I had to take part in all the, the there was a seven day ceremony after the, after the burial and then there was a 40 day ceremony. So you just got to put your work on one side and if farmers have to put their work on one side that will affect the amount they're growing in the fields and the amount of food they've got to eat for the next year. So things like that are quite considerable. And then things like ch changing climate, and we did some work a few years ago looking at farmers' perceptions of rainfall patterns, and they are noticing that rainfall patterns are changing. Um, there's much more sort of incidences of storms, and sometimes the rains start and then they stop, and that can be a problem. Um, so 77% um, of respondents said that coping with shocks affected food production and purchasing power. So how do they cope with these shocks? Well, most of the households are amazingly resilient. They're poor, but they're amazingly resilient. Um, they use the upland farm method where they use intercropping. They plant a whole range of crops together, which means if one crop fails, they've got others to fall back on. Um, they are increasing the amount of swamp rice farming. When I was there in 74, there was very little swamp rice farming, but Jerem found in his work that swamp rice farming is increasing. Okay? The advantage of that is you can use the same swamp year after year. You don't have to move to another location. And there's undoubtedly an increase in cash crops. Things like coffee and cocoa are being grown and are being sold um, sorry, are being sold in nearby, nearby towns, and also things like palm oil and so on. And so there has been some agricultural diversification, but there's also livelihood diversification. People, as well as farmers, they're diamond mining. You very rarely get full-time diamond miners. They tend to do it when they've har the harvest is in, and they go and do it part-time. Blacksmiths, carpenters, hunters, um, just in recent years, people have set up cell phone charging centres because Kaima, until recently, didn't have any electricity. Um, and there's no water in the homes either. Uh, so these charging... Every, lots of farmers have a cell phone. The cell phone has transformed rural Africa. Um, remittances have increased because of cell phones. We know people in London that are regularly sending money um, uh, through their cell phone to, to, their, to their friends and relatives in remote parts like this. And the other thing that we've noticed a change in is the motorcycle taxis, or Okadas as they're called. Um, I was terrified of going on the back of one of these motorbikes, you know, particularly on the rock road. But uh, I ought to tell you that Jerem travelled for probably three or more hours with his suitcase on the back of, a, a, back of a, a motorbike bouncing around on this road. My God, I'd have been terrified. Um, but there is still considerable amount of food, food insecurity. Um, let me just uh, say a few words about this. Um, food, in, food security is all about individuals, households, and uh, at various levels, uh, achieving when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. That's the World Food Summit pronouncement on what food security is. Well, the World Food Programme has done a study in Sierra Leone, and in 2011, they found that 54% of the population are suffering from food insecurity. And 7.4% are classified as severely food insecure. You'll be shocked when I tell you that the average household in Sierra Leone only has, um, um, actually, that should be New Zealand dollars, I think. Um, 
Uh, Kaye, no, sorry, that is U.S. dollars. Kaye Moroni has uh, 133 U.S. dollars. That's the average household cash per year in Kaima. The Sierra Leone figure is there, 847, but Kaima, 133 U.S. dollars. This just gives you some idea of the level of poverty uh, amongst this community. 87% of the country's farmers are growing rice, and 63% are growing the upland rice, but the yields are very low by international standards and haven't really increased in recent years. And 65% of households that cultivate rice, I'm oh, sorry, um, that cultivate rice, um, sorry, I've gone back. 65% uh, of households that cultivate rice did not produce enough to feed the family. So there's a sort of poverty trap for many, for many families. Uh, they don't get enough food to feed themselves, therefore they're weak when they go to the farm, therefore they can't make a bigger farm. Land is not a problem uh, in this area. It's fairly sparsely settled. It's labor that's the problem, um, shortage of labor. Um, so we looked into more details about food insecurity, and we found that there is seasonal food insecurity. The worst time of the year is in June, July, and August. That's the middle of the rainy season. And the local people call it the hungry season because their harvest from the previous year is beginning to run out. But they're working hard in the farm. They're uh, weeding or uh, getting rid of uh, uh, birds and rodents and things like that. It's, and there's also a lot of malaria around at that time of the year. It's raining heavily. So this hungry season is the lowest ebb, uh, June, July, and August. And then the first new crops start to ripen, and things pick up, and the nutrition levels pick up as a result. So over 90% of rural households um, in, in Sierra Leone, according to World Food Programme, experience a hungry season. Um, a quotation here from a farmer the months before the harvest are, har are the hardest. There's no food for my family to eat. When we harvest in September, it is joyous, oh so joyous. It sort of sums up how they, how they feel. But we also detected another form of food security. And this is intra-household food security within households. Um, so a typical family meal is rice, boiled rice, with a sort of stew poured over the top of it. But what we found is that there's a hierarchy of eating the food. The guests eat first, the men eat next, the women and then the children. So this means that the women and children are getting probably no nutrition, at, well, they're just getting the rice and perhaps a bit of sauce. They're not getting any protein. There's very little protein in the food anyway. There might be a few fish caught in the stream. There's not a lot of meat eaten. But because of this hierarchy, um, we found that within households, there is this food insecurity. And a quotation here of a, a head teacher looking at a group of boys. For those boys, they only eat once a day um, after the rest of their family has eaten, sometimes as late as 9 or 10 at night. It's no wonder that they cannot concentrate on their schoolwork when they're always hungry. So this is typical of many, many um, households that we, we talk to. Um, so um, what about the issue of resilience? I say these people are poor but, and they cope with shocks, but they're fairly resilient. They sort of bounce back. The, the town was completely abandoned during the Civil War. But they've built it up again. They've bounced back. They've got their farming going again. There's a need to look more carefully at how agriculture and mining are dovetailing together, which was my, the topic I worked on in 1974. Jerem used the sustainable livelihoods folk framework to focus on his work. Um, education is better now than it was in 1974. There are now five or more primary schools, and there's a secondary school as well. Um, so there's more schooling and training, but of course that can lead to out-migration 
and that can lead to a loss of labour on the farm. Youth employment is a problem because there's very little paid work in Kaima, and vocational training is needed in skills. Healthcare is very fragile. Um, the, the clinic is very basic. The nearest hospital is three hours' drive away in Koidu. Um, connectivity is better. Cell, cell phones are there, but the roads and the transport are definitely poorer than they were in 1974. That's amazing, isn't it? You know, um, nearly 50 years, um, and the roads are worse than they were then. Um, water, sanitation, and power. Well, most people have pit latrines. Uh, most people don't have water and power in their homes. But just last year, I was there in January, but in late last year, the British Government Aid Project has put in a solar power system. And I've got one or two pictures of that in a minute. So it's important to try and overcome this food insecurity. Um, there needs to be education on household practices. I, I think the children need to be taught in school all about the hierarchy of who eats the meal when, you know. I think that's an important educational issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, there needs to be more community food banks and school feeding programs. But of course, this is all situated in a weak state, the, one of the poorest countries in the world. And there's a whole issue of how the state engages and disengages. The answer really is the state does not engage very much with Sierra Leone because it's so remote. So what's the future? Well, um, there needs to be capacity building to cushion households from these shocks, to somehow reduce vulnerability. Mobility needs to be improved. The roads, when I was there in 74, the communities that the road passed through used to work on the road. Used to, it's only a, a dirt road, but they used to work on it. That seems to have lapsed. But the Paramount Chief did say that they were planning to, to get it going again. There's a strong risk aversion mentality. These farmers, all through the year, are dis trying to avoid risk because they want to feed their families. So risk aversion often leads to a lack of innovation because they're too busy avoiding risk. They, they feel it's risky to innovate. And there's a strong dependency mentality as uh, getting continued assistance from um, projects that do get involved in the community. But the term I use about Kaima is there is resilience without development. If development is all about improving the quality of life, I don't really think that's happening, but they've got resilience, they've developed resilience to cope with these shocks and the vulnerabilities that are occurring every year. There's a need to build up assets like growing cash crops and selling them um, to give finance, also strengthening the health and education systems. Jeremy, in his thesis, used the French term, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. This was his conclusion in his, in his thesis. And I asked the question, will things still be the same in another 40 years' time? Um, but anyway, I think I don't want to leave you all in a sort of gloomy frame of mind. I guess one can get very gloomy about these things. But I believe um, we should look to the future. And I, as a, a teacher and a researcher in a university, I believe that development research should have some practical value. I don't see a lot of point in us teaching development studies in universities unless it actually leads to development on the ground. Now, that development on the ground could be somewhere like uh, poor Maori communities in Northland. It could be South Dunedin, but it could be somewhere like Sierra Leone if development is all about improving the quality of life. So I think development research should help to promote a more nuanced understanding of the complexities and the actors involved in, in development. 
policy recommendations emanating for research, from research should lead to formulating appropriate strategies for implementation with the communities concerned. Implementation with the communities, working with the communities, not just implanting it on them. Too much development research has been distant and hands-off and has not fully engaged with communities. Um, the earlier work that Etienne and I have done, in South Africa particularly, was where we went into communities and looked at initiatives there after the end of apartheid, and we looked at how those initiatives might be supported to uplift the community. Development interventions must be democratic and not dictatorial, identifying and then fully lo fulfilling local needs and aspirations. And I believe that achieving a tangible improvement in the quality of life should be the essential objective of all development interventions. Local capacity building and good governance are vital, and discussions with the community to identify appropriate interventions in education and health are important. So this is what we've been doing in Kaima, just to finish off with, um, with the help of people here in the Dunedin community. This is the nursery school that we've been building. Uh, and I must thank the geography students who did sausage sizzles on George Street and sponsored aerobics at Unipol and so on. Uh, and um, I would also like to thank the, um, the, um, the, the Union of Graduate Women who gave me quite a lot of funding um, uh, to, to get this project off the ground. We, we asked the community, what do you need in the education area? And I thought it might have been a couple of classrooms on the primary school, but they wanted a nursery school for the youngest children. So this is the nursery school um, in its early stages, and this is it in its later stages, and you can see the roof, the roof still had to be, had to be fitted on. Um, and then this is when the roof was finished and the painting was done. And this is the official ceremony that we had to open the nursery school. And um, this woman here is uh, Finda Johnny. She is the primary school principal. And her father, uh, Pa Johnny, as we called him, lived until he was about 96. And he was a great friend of mine. And I'm pleased that she's now principal of the primary school. And we've made her one of the trustees of the nursery school. This is the chief here, and here's me, and they'd never heard of cutting a ribbon before. Uh, so, but Finder found a piece of ribbon. You see, everybody's looking quite bewildered. Uh, so uh, here we are cutting the ribbon to open the, officially open the school. And this was taken just this year. Um, can you see they're all holding teddies? Uh, I took out... Um, 30-odd teddies, uh, which were knitted by uh, Karen Stevenson, who's not with us tonight. Karen is, wife Stevens, uh, is uh, Wayne Stevenson's wife, and she's great at knitting. And apparently she's knitted another 25 for me to take. They were quite light to carry, uh, but they took up half of my suitcase. But the children were thrilled to bits when they got these teddies from Dunedin. Um, this is what I think is development in practice, you know. Um, and then we've turned our attention to the clinic. And the clinic here, um, I took this picture just a couple of years ago, and the clinic really hasn't changed since um, uh, 1974. I'll never forget one of the most moving, you know, I was 26 years old, and I went into this end room of the clinic here, and there was the dispenser, they don't have a doctor, they have a dispenser who was trained to sort of NCA level two or something like that, but totally committed. And there were a couple of midwives, and I can never, I'll never forget this, cowering in the corner of the room was a woman who looked totally exhausted. And the dispenser was holding her day-old baby. And the baby had been born in the bush in a, a, a remote village, and they'd cut the cord with a rusty razor blade. And this baby had tetanus, the advanced stages of tetanus. I can remember holding this baby, and it was as rigid as a board. 
and I handed it back to the dispenser and a couple of minutes later it died. That was the first time in my life that I saw a child die and I shall never forget it. And this is where women come to give birth from hundreds of villages around. Well, I'm pleased to say that this has become another project. Um, my good friends at St. Margaret's College raised over $5,000, and I thank Charles Tustin and the team at St. Margaret's College. And so this is the project that's going on now. Uh, I've also had more money from uh, the geography students, and on Thursday we've got a quiz, which we're raising money from the geography students. And here, this was a, an older picture I took of the women queuing up with their babies to have vaccinations. Um, and this shows you some of the problems. The roofs were all leaking. So what we've done, and I'm getting regular updates on WhatsApp. Uh, we've, got, we've got the Paramount Chief's right-hand man in charge. The roof has been fixed. They put a new roof on. Uh, all these um, uh, leaks have been plugged. Um, and um, this is the solar power thing that I told you about. It was only installed in December last year, so we've got to see what effect it will have. Um, it had a British government, there was a British flag on the outside of it. But the issue is, you know, will it be maintained? Hopefully it's going to supply the whole community with electricity. It's right next to the clinic, so the clinic will be the first user of this. And this is what the clinic looks like now, thanks to our paint work and the workmen. What I want to do now is to use the additional money to buy some new beds and things for inside the clinic. Um, uh, because we've done the outside, it's now watertight. We want to make the environment inside the clinic comfortable and bright for, for mainly the women that come and have their, their babies there. So this is Kaima. And just to finish off with, um, I'd like to go back to what Doreen Massey said, that if places can be, can be conceptualized in terms of social interactions which tie them together, then it's also the case that these interactions themselves are not motionless things frozen in time, they're processes. Okay, there have been processes going on in Kaima. Sadly, there hasn't really been much in the way of development I'd like to think that the work that we're doing is going to help the community um, in some considerable way. And I think the, the longitudinal study has shed light on the processes of change, social interactions, and adaptation over time. But the phrase I would use is resilience without development, and poverty still persists. So Kaima is just one community in Sierra Leone, one community in Africa, but there are thousands like it in Sierra Leone and elsewhere. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for that, Tony. That was insightful and inspiring. And I think you'll agree with me that Tony is a gifted speaker with an ability to blend both a sense of humor with a sense of humanity, but also deep academic insight into the topics which he's dealing with. I had the privilege of being with Tony and Jerem and Kaima six years ago when Tony was made a chief. And that was quite a moving ceremony to participate in. But also just one thing which Tony finished off with, with the challenges of development, which it reminded me of, is in a meeting we had with the teachers in Kaima, uh, we were asking them yeah. what they felt their needs were in the community. And um, we had a sense that possibly they'd be talking about furniture or, pos or perhaps even computers for their, 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 their classrooms, which we knew they didn't have. And what the teachers said that what they actually wanted were actually typewriters, because typewriters was something they aspired to achieve in that community. But uh, typing, not computer studies, but typing, was a subject in the schools there. And the way they taught it is each student had a sheet of cardboard with the letters of the, of the keyboard layout written on it. And they practiced literally think, touch typing on the cardboard. So that does represent the real challenges which still, unfortunately, persist in the world. And that's why it's so important that reflections like Tony's this evening help and ground us in the, re in the reality of dif 
differences and difficulties in the world, but also the very positive contributions which can be made through positive interventions like those Tony is engaged in. And at an academic level, Tony has brought rigor to the debate of these issues. He's absolutely correct that there's very few longitudinal studies of this type in Africa. And what we're seeing is by interrogating the challenges of development, it, it challenges us not only to understand better that resilience can't just be seen in the contemporary sense, but there is a long historical tale to it, which sometimes means, as Tony argued, that you can have resilience without development. And I think that in itself is going to be quite a major contribution which no one really has articulated up to this point. Um, Ideally, I would be inviting questions at this stage, but instead I'm going to invite everyone to join us upstairs at the social event and please use the opportunity to talk with Tony, to ask him questions and to find out more about his work and his insights. A big thank you to everyone here for celebrating with us in this event, the annual Ron Liston Memorial Lecture. And, and lastly, and once again, a big thank you to Tony for um, his, his wonderful lecture this evening. So thank you, Tony. Thank you.